profoundly beautiful. It was like an hour and a half lecture where by the end, people were crying and they wanted to just transform them, their lives, give away everything to charity and live on a mountain somewhere. And people were crying and sobbing. And then when I went to save the recording, it wasn't there because I had forgotten to record. So I'm trying really hard not to remember. I, I'm sorry, not to forget <laughs> to do the recording. So. All right. One thing I want to mention is uh, I've been I've been talking to several different people and I wanted to tell you about something that I um, that I think I want to do it right now. And if you guys like it, tell me right away and we will just institute it as part of the, the regular process. Um, oh, the stupid dog is barking. Give me a sec. I'm, I'm going to, I don't think the background will change because it, it's unrecorded, but my head is going to move. I'm going to walk outside and let the dumb dog in. She's, she's not dumb. She's a dog being a dog, but she loves little girls. And so whenever a little girl comes by the house, she has to bark at her. And it just, it's, infuri no, but ghost used to hear. So it's just infuriating. Come on, Ayla. Silly thing. Anyway, so I'm going to. I, I'm holding on to one of the dogs, and we're just going to sit here for a bit until she comes back inside. All right. The the proposal that I have is for the weekly reflection. What I am thinking of doing is making it so that instead of it having to be written, what you guys can do is um, a video essay. where you do uh, like you record yourself in a Teams meeting with just you and you share the screen with uh, the piece of artwork that you're applying the tools of artistic critique on. And then at the end, and you say at the beginning, weekly reflection, such and such, we covered this material in the module. And at the end, you, you say that the screen share is the artwork that was in the module kind of thing. And, th and that's going to be your um, citation, essentially. If you do this, it's going to be about three to five minutes. It's going to need to be a video three to five minutes long. You're going to have to record it in MOV, MP4, or WAV, WAV format, and submit the file. And that will be your weekly reflection. So three to five minutes long. And I thought if we're, if if that sounds good to you guys, what I'm going to go ahead and do is um, share an image and apply the uh, tools of artistic critique so you can see how that's done. And then um, then that, that's what you will do when you... Uh, I'm sorry. Wait, when you when you do your weekly reflection, so I'm gonna I'm pulling up right now an image. That I can use the tools of artistic critique on. All right, this is this is great. This will be a good one. Okay, I'm I'm give me a second. I'm gonna try to pull the dog in really quick before we do this. If I lose contact, sorry, would you stop barking? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come here. Come here, sweetie. There we go.
she doesn't understand that her voice is scary to three-year-old little girls. And so when they start getting upset, she just barks louder trying to kill, get them to calm down, which I don't know if you guys ever watched Seinfeld when uh, um, the one guy would scream serenity now. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Okay. Here's the image. All right. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this artist at all. But this is the image that I'm going to critique for the purposes of this class. What I would do doing this weekly reflection is say something like, let's say that this is an image that we came across in today's this week's module, which is uh, street art. And uh, I um, I'll just do start with the, the different steps. I'll go through each of the four steps, um, and then uh, and show you how that works. Before we do that, what is the first step of artistic critique? What is the first tool? Describe. Describe. Excellent. We talk about what color it is, how big it is, uh, maybe who did it, what are what are the materials that we can recognize. Um, height, weight, pant size, all that kind of stuff. What is the second tool of artistic critique? Analyze. Analyze. This is where we start guessing how the person made it. You know, how, how do they do it? How do they find the place that they put it in? How did they put it together? What tools did they use? And then, um, Jenny, what's the, what's the third one? It's interpretation. Interpretation. This is where you can bring in uh, what you know about the context of the thing and then what you see in it yourself. What does it mean to you and, and why? You know, be, uh, be specific about that. And what's the last one? Evaluation. Evaluation. And this is where, what you talk about. Is it successful? Okay, so I'm going to apply those to this image. This is uh, called Dinner for One by Slinkachu. And describing it, it appears to be, it, it looks like somebody who is uh, like a, a, a miniature of a person sitting down on a tiny table with, I don't know if this is like a, a spaghetti a noodle of some sort, but it looks like there's uh, mud or or sauce or something like that around at the bottom of the can, but it does look like an old style steel can. It has that ridging there uh, to give it the, that material strength. It If this is a can, it looks like uh, maybe this person is about three quarter inches tall at the most, maybe a little bit smaller than that. And maybe this is actually sauce that's from a can and these are like um spaghetti type pre-canned stuff it, it looks like this is um uh, the figure is a male holding a knife and a fork getting and the artist has designed it so we can usually read this as somebody getting ready to eat something okay so that's and it has relevance to this, uh, to the module, because the module is about street art. And this was something that we, we, uh, we didn't see this particular piece in it, but we did talk about Slinkachu. Okay, so that's the, that's the first step. And so in this, this video, video uh, weekly reflection, the second step is analyze. So it looks to me like this, this is a railroad model you know, a, a railroad train model figure of some sort that the artist painted uh, perhaps and, and put in. It looks like this is again, a, a railroad model table. I don't know if this is a real noodle. It looks to me like it was um, like one of those uh, foam stringer type things that, that the artist cut. And I say that because right here, it looks like this is a cut mark right there. 
I'm thinking this is something more like glue mixed with colorant rather than actual sauce. It looks to me like this is um, maybe um, like two part acrylic or something that you'd use in jewelry or something that the that the artist put in there with the with these noodles so that it would be a lot more stable uh, than using the actual sauce. It looks to me like this is an actual steel can that the artist used. And it looks to me like um, the artist colorized this uh, the two part casting epoxy with um, something to make it look like you know canned sauce. And as it was drying, put in these plastic noodle things that they that they cut, um, and then set the table and the, the 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 figure of the man on top of it, and then let it let it cure and set all together. That's what it looks like to me. So, what is the difference between description and analyze? With analyze, you're a bit more specific on how it was made. Like you, like you're looking more specifically at the materials to start thinking about how was it made, what, why exactly did they use this medium, um, things like that. The finer details. Yeah, excellent. E exactly right. Uh, just, just trying to imagine what they did from my own experience, but also. Uh, if I know anything about the artist and their their way of uh, processing, maybe too, but um, I'm just guessing because that's what those materials remind me of in my own work. So yeah, exactly. That's that's the biggest difference. So the third step is interpret. Now this artist has a history of tongue in cheek observations of contemporary culture, and it's generally white Western culture. And so it doesn't surprise me that this looks like a typical uh, middle income individual, uh, a typical white male who's uh, bald wearing, you know, a pretty standard shirt. It doesn't look like the person is dressed to the nines or anything like that. I can identify a knife and a fork. So it looks like it is somebody sitting around getting ready to eat a typical meal. And that's what the artist is trying to get us to reference. But then you start getting the play on size because this artist think at you always uh, works with miniatures and uh, forces you to think about ordinary situations in a new in new lights using uh, the reference point of railroad miniatures. So knowing that, I'm thinking rather than a plastic shape, this is supposed to represent some sort of canned pasta noodle which um, for a while when I was really sick, that was the only thing I could eat because it was so highly processed. So I wonder if this is also a metaphor for overeating highly overprocessed foods. Um, you know, there's, we have a, a problem in our culture today where our um, tissues of our body are no longer acting the way they should. They're, we're no longer as healthy as we are, even if we eat right, because of the sheer volume of microplastics and extraneous products that we accept into our systems because of the processed food that is so ubiquitous. You know, it's almost impossible to avoid consuming processed food. And um, I, I'm thinking that maybe this person is also, the, the, the way that they are intently looking at the food and getting ready to eat seems like this is a, a really in, um, important event that the person is excited about. And then, you know, looking at how awful that, that noodle appears to be, I wonder if he's asking, if the artist is asking us to think a little bit about our relationship with consumables, not just food, but with the ideas of materialization and um, industrialization industrialization of food processing you know i i think that he, he's not necessarily giving a judgment on it but is asking us to look intently at our relationship with those processes and uh so i i think that 
having it such a small scale allows us to embrace a potentially serious subject with a, a heavy dose of humor, it makes it a lot more palatable to think about. And it helps us to realize that the artist is not condemning anybody. It, it feels like the artist is communicating that he thinks it's, the whole situation is ridiculous. Now let's take a look at it and see if we're a player in the rid ridiculousness or if we can do anything about it. it. It doesn't need to have anything done about it, but to at least be aware of our cultural situation and relationship with the industrialized food processing. You know, and, and it may be completely different, but that's that's my interpretation. How is that different than the analyze? Jenny, are you able to chime in on that? Or do you want to? Um. Well, interpreting, it's it's like your own ideas of what it could be versus what the author intended it to be. Like when I was looking at the, this image, I'm thinking of like American, um, like super, you know, like superfoods, how we eat just in massive amounts of portion kind, yeah. of, kind of a thing. And so I don't know yeah. if that's what the author intended, but that's what I thought. And I think interpretation is more on a personal level than um, yeah. analyzing. Well, and, and analyzing, we're just looking at, from our own experience, how did the person make it? And interpretation, I think you're exactly right. It is much more personal because it may be nothing like what the guy intended. But it, it's interesting because your thoughts and my thoughts are synced up really closely. And I, I, and I think that what we see in things that we don't have a lot of information about is reflective of thoughts that we're processing already. And so I, I think by its nature, the interpretation process needs to be individual. So yeah, yeah I, you're exactly right. Then the first step is evaluation. I, I think at, at the central point of, of creating art, when we're the creators, we want somebody, we need somebody to engage with it somehow. Whether or not we ever meet whoever engages with it, we want them to engage with it. And I think as far as that goes, this is engaging. When you see something that you see, uh, you know, a regular size soup can and the teeny tiny little person there, it is humorous, but immediately it engages us and we want to look at it more. What is this? It, like we in last week's discussion about Jean-Claude and Christo, it engages the monkey mind, the curiosity in us. And I, I think that is successful. The fact that we are able to hold internal conversations about our relationship with culture and the a culture is a acculturation of uh, industrialized food processing. That fact alone that that, that comes up and it becomes a, a, a thing also makes this successful as, as a piece of art. You know, and and as far as art goes, I would say that this is not necessarily, you know, a, a formal sculpture. This is a, a, it appears to me, it feels to me like it's a conceptual piece because immediately it starts engaging you or inviting you to think and to start uh, using your imagination. So I think this is a very successful piece. So, and, and for my uh, citation, what I would do is uh, type up the citation for the website uh, with the, the accessed on date after it and just show as a final three seconds of my video that citation and say, you know, so I got this. Or if it's an image that I pulled right out of the module, I would just verbally say, I pulled this image from the module. All right. So that that's, I would really like everybody is listening to this and especially you two guys because. Both of you guys are, are really active in the class. I want you to, to, to try that. Think about that. Try that as a weekly reflection if you're inclined. And let me know if you want me to include it as a permanent option for future classes. And again, the video should only be three to five minutes. But I want to hear you talk. And you don't. The only writing in it is if you use an outside source, have the citation written. 
And if you don't, if you use a module, you don't have to do any writing. You just begin with uh, this is a weekly reflection for week 13. We're talking about street art. And I pulled this image from one of the images in the model module. All right. So we, if, if you guys are inclined to do that, please do it. And then let me know uh, like next week if you like that as um, an option for doing this. And remember, I need to get a, a an MP4, MOV, or WAV uh, video file. And you can, uh, that's, I think MP4 is what automatically downloads when you do the, the Teams meeting recording. And if you can't, I think, Jenny, you've been linking it to a YouTube thing. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So I've been recording it on Teams and then uploading it to YouTube and then making sure that it goes public, not private. Okay. But yeah, that's um, I, what I've been doing and then sharing the link. I, I, I prefer to have the file sent to me directly. If some okay. systems that's not going to work, but I prefer to have the file so I can upload it to our class, um, our class YouTube channel. Um, if, and if you do it public, it should be okay because then I can still do a save and link it to our uh, our class through that. So I, I prefer the file, but if it's not working for you, then the link on a, a public shared space is just fine. Okay. So yeah, do try that if you can, if you don't mind, and let me know what you think, if, if that's a viable uh, form for, for uh, future weekly modules. All right. Now I, we're going to dive in. I, I want to show you a little bit about this stuff and then we'll go into the regular module. Um, I'm sorry, my, sometimes there is a little bit of a struggle as I get everything situated because there's a little bit of a delay on my, um, my, my display and things shift around a little bit. What that means is when I start clicking on stuff, even though I click on where I see it at the moment that I'm clicking on it, the computer is still processing. So it thinks I've clicked on something else and it really aggravates me. Okay, um, this week's module is about graffiti, street art, and public space. But I want to share with you something else really quick. And it was uh, just talking about last week's stuff really briefly. Um, there's a, a book. Let's see if I can find that again. There's a book that I would like everybody to, to read if you can. I am 98% sure that they have it at the library. Um, if not, you can get it as on a Kindle uh, pretty easily. But the book is called Spirituality and Art by Wassily Kandinsky. Do you guys remember who Wassily Kandinsky was? Do either of you remember? He was, uh, we talked about him in the module uh, Sound into Art. Uh, he was a painter who really explored the idea of um, non-objective abst abstraction because he suffered from synesthesia where he would see sounds or uh, hear colors and his paintings kind of, he, he worked on his paintings as a way to process that. But this book concerning the spiritual in art is a, a really important book and um, what I love, what I love about it, there's there's a number of things that I really enjoy about this book. But one of the things that he discusses in it is the role of artist as prophet. Which, I mean, you know, that that sounds like it could be really loaded. But what what he talks about basically is that the artist, most people, don't dive headlong into their uh, capacity to create as artists as are expected to. 
And um, everybody is an artist on some level, but the title seems to belong only to those people who really commit themselves at points in their life to being the creative person. And uh, one of the things he talks about is because of this interesting position in society, the artist is at a point where they can see a lot more around them and they think about what they see a lot more um, intentfully than people who are just or, you know, ordinarily living their lives. And from that perspective, the artist can look at their society as uh, uh, in the role of a prophet from a couple different perspectives. Uh, from a couple different positions. One is a prophet judges, and another is a, ju a prophet predicts. And I was sharing this profound website with you, and I didn't realize that I wasn't sharing it. But this is some of his artwork. So when I say, uh, you know, he's talking about the artist judges, it's not like condemnation but the artist is in a position to observe things that most people just take for granted. And, um, and you know, are you guys familiar with something called the reticular activating system? Have you ever heard of that term? The RAS is a thing that's about that big that is at the base of your two halves of your brain. And it, it so it, it sits like a little connector in between those two halves. And it's the processing core for deciding what your conscious mind needs to pay attention to. What this thing does is, do, do any of you want to guess how many bits of information your brain receives at any given moment? Say for any five minutes, how many bits of information your brain typically receives? I'd say anywhere between 90,000 to 100,000. I don't know. At, at, at the very least. It is between uh, that number and up to 2 million bits of information at any given section of time. That's astounding. How many, uh, how much does your RAS weed out and feed you consciously? And I'll give you a hint. It is a dramatically smaller number. That was, Jenny, that was actually a really good guess because about 20 years ago when people started thinking about this, they were thinking initially between 75 and 120,000 bits of information. And it's only more recently than they started thinking it was up to 2 million. So excellent, excellent guess. Consciously, we only, that RAS, that reticular activating system only feeds us 20 to 40 bits of information. So it weeds out all that other stuff, all the different shades of color, all the different uh, voices in the background, all the different sounds of the wind going through the grass or the people honking at us because we suck at driving, or you know, I'm sorry, personal sharing, or uh, any of those other things. It weeds all that out and only feeds us the things that our conscious mind tells it we want to acknowledge. And what Wassily Kandinsky says is that part of our role as the artist prophet is to examine the things that people weed out, that other people weed out. And it's it's not to condemn, it's not to judge in, in that typical sense, but it's to be observe, an observer and judge in the sense of these are um, sharing or underlying the things that are important without necessarily telling people whether they're good or bad. You know, we, we want an artist's role as prophet is to engage a society in self-reflection and thinking rather than to condemn it for the most part. And then he also talks about the artist's role as predictor uh, or, or the artist's role of profit as predictor. Where could the society be going? Where should the society be going? What are the things that we need to focus on as being more important to help us to be happier. And it, what, what is interesting to me about this is 
and, and this, this is an anecdotal observation. I just think it's really fascinating. When artists are hopeful, when they help us to think of things that are good, when they help us remind us of the worthwhile things that we have done and that we can do more of those worthwhile things in the future, it seems that that, that is a position that is uh, endlessly sustainable. The artist can also always find more things to be happy about and share. But when the artist is driven by a consuming desire to share hatred and anger, that seems to fizzle out. That, does, that, that kind of energy source doesn't seem to be sustainable, and I, which, I, which I think is really kind of interesting. So yeah, it, it's fun to be entertained by uh, things like Jason, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, and all that kind of stuff, and you know, The Walking Dead, but the entertainment that's really sustainable, that we keep going back to, that we keep enjoying, is the stuff that makes us feel better, that makes us want to be better. And this was um, talked about by Aslepus in about 400 BC, talking about, and then um, I think it may have been Aristotle, late, late, no, Aeschylus, um, where he was talking about the role of drama and theater in a society. It's to help you to find those things within yourself and give you the, the or empower you to change them so you can be a better person. And I, and I love that perspective on art. So in, anyway, I, I think that this is really beautiful. So it definitely, let me show you where this article is. It's right here in that uh, previous module. So definitely go to that article and watch it. And I would heavily recommend reading the book uh, concerning the spirituality, spiritual and art. You can find it on Amazon and it's in a Dover publication. It's like $8. Or you can also get it for a couple bucks as a, a Kindle. And you can also find free PDFs of it online. And so this is just an overview of the stuff we're going to talk about for the rest of the semester, essentially. But I, I love that article because then, and it ties in directly with what we're talking about this week. And I just erased, oh, that's so irritating. I just erased what we were going to be talking about. So give me just a, a second here. But it ties in because this week we're talking about street art and, and uh, these kinds of very contemporary, very visceral, one-on-one -on -one, uh, kinds of uh, uh, communications that people do. I think that's appropriate because it seems to me that street art is really good at addressing immediate concerns. Whatever is going on in the society, street art addresses what's going on right now, asking us to think about it, to be self-reflective. Or in the Marvel Universe, Marvel um, Cinematic Universe lingo, uh, be meta, meta about it. And I, I, I think that that's really fascinating. This is an example of the oldest graffiti that is still around. This um, about 70 AD. And what I so love is what I so love about it is Petronia and Julia, two girlfriends who scribbled this. It looks to me like when they were about four and five years old on the side of their house in uh, Austria, two, over 2,000 years ago. Isn't that amazing? I mean, two best friends doing that. I, I think that that's, that's wonderful. But this is, an, this is one of the oldest examples of graffiti. What is, uh, what, one of the things they talk about as graffiti and street art, they both take place in the public space, but the difference between graffiti and street art is for graffiti to qualify as graffiti, it has to be illegal. Um, people make references to graffiti style work. A lot of times Basquiat is an artist that is referred to as uh, elevating graffiti. But for graffiti to qualify fully as graffiti, it must be illegal. 
So it's vandalism. It, it cannot be endorsed by any sort of state institution. So do not become a graffiti artist. Now, if you get permission, even though you may do the exact same thing, then it becomes street art. Isn't that interesting? Did either of you know that? So on this, in this module, there's a lot of articles to go through, um, a lot of uh, videos. These ones like this are articles and these ones are videos. And I think that um, what I wanna do is share with you, we'll talk about the articles, because I don't know, we might watch a video or two, but um, I, I, I want to share this with you. What is kind of frustrating to me sometimes is these articles that I find, I, I do everything I can to make sure that they're free to, for you to access. But what that means sometimes is that ads show up. So I am really sorry. But this, um, this is a history of, of graffiti and, and what's going on. What I don't like is when somebody shows something like this and saying this this is the earliest graffiti this is not the earliest graffiti do you guys know why cave art prehistorical art is not the earliest graffiti the cave art that survives is found after an arduous journey generally it 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 feels like a lot of the cave art is found in areas that are difficult to go through, go to, almost as if the person is, or the viewer is being forced to go through a birth canal or um, a grave to get to where the art is. You know, it, you have to go out of your way. It's difficult to get there. Why is that different from graffiti? Graffiti is more um, accessible. Like it's just yeah. something that you can go to very quickly and just color on, draw yeah, on. Exactly. It, it is. It has to be accessible. It's a public space work. And uh, cave, a lot of this cave art, even the, the petroglyph art in uh, in Utah and uh, Southeast Washington, other areas like that, it, they are areas that are not necessarily very easy to get to. Uh, you know, a lot of them you have to go out of your way. You have to climb up the cliff face. You have to go around a corner. You have to climb uh, a set of falls or whatever to get to. And uh, I, I think that to, to see, I, I should say, it, you, you know, you, the the visit the viewer has to be in a a specific position to to see. And uh, even though some cave art is, it's almost impossible to imagine how they did what they did. It's uh, not cave art, excuse me, with graffiti. Even if it's impossible for us to see how they did what they did, it is still visible to us. It's still public space. So yeah, actually, I mean, Jenny, you hit it right on the head. What is fascinating about this to me though, is you know we, we look at these kinds of things and when you see handprints in prehistoric cave art, uh, there was a Scandinavian, I think it was Norwegian, anthropologist who was a um, statistician as well, analyzed the handprints. And if you guys hold up your hand like this, both uh, Jenny and, and America, hold up your hand. For women, statistically women, these two fingers, um, the, the ring finger and the, and the middle finger are going to be the same length. You know, if, if you move it so that the knuckles stand at the same level, they're gonna be at the same length or that ring finger is gonna be a hair longer. And that is true for about 82% of women around the world. That's not true for any of the three of us, which is irritating. Um, you, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Most of the time when I have uh, people do this in the class, if, if there's more than seven people in the class, you will see three or four of, of the women will have that exact thing on their, on their fingers. So for me, if I if I balance it out so that the, the uh, knuckles are at the same level, you can see my ring finger is noticeably shorter. For 82% of women around the world, 
these two fingers are going to be the same length or this one is going to be longer, but it will look shorter because the knuckle is further is closer to the wrist. Does that make sense? What this person did, looking at the handprints on cave art from, you know, up to 55,000 years ago, they found out that just by that standard alone, at least three quarters of the handprints were made by women. Which, uh, and since they were intermingled with all this other art, the person said, you know, it's not that much of an intellectual leap to believe that if three quarters of the handprint art is made by women, there's a good chance that three quarters of the art overall is made by women as well. Isn't that interesting? Because we have this assumption that cave art is made by men, cavemen. But it doesn't feel like that's really the case. I, I think that that's, or predominantly made by, by men. Anyway, um, now the difference between these two things is that this work is, it, it is done specifically in an area that's not the easiest to get to. Um, and it it feels like it is it's a very specific thing that's going on and here this is written on the outside of a wall probably without the permission of the people that lived in there maybe maybe it is but probably not so that that's what the difference is or things like that where people write their names uh, the tags that people would use and these are numbers or identifiers uh, uh, people that are um, trying to gain power back in societies where they feel voiceless. A lot of the times that's where these kind, this kind of tagging shows up. And then when they, people start doing stuff that exhibits a little bit of a sense of humor, you know, this stuff actually started really big in about 1930s in, in the U.S., what happened in 1930s in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world? Oh, well, yeah, the Great Depression. Yeah. A lot of people found themselves homeless, and they started traveling around the country in boxcars, uh, in, uh, on trains, illegally, traveling everywhere. And um, there was a kind of an informal language that grew up called uh, hobo. And it was uh, identifiers where they would talk about who they were, where they went to. Um, and uh, what homes were, were safe to eat at, what would people be nice to you, where to, who to stay away from. And uh, a lot of the origin of tagging came from that period, which I think is, is really interesting. In 1970s, this is where you start seeing this, um, an expansion of a little bit more uh, fun design. You know, it seems to be a little bit more visually engaging. And I think that a big part of that might be because uh, early 60s into the early 70s, that's where you see a lot of people starting uh, uh, paint and spray cans being a lot more accessible to a lot more people. It became an easy way uh, to make a, a permanent mark. You didn't have to have, you know, a can and a paintbrush. And it's interesting to me because a lot of this kind of stuff you see that's involving is not made with chalk or, or regular brush paint, but it is made with spray cans. And then you get um, cartoonists that are adapting graffiti style characters into acceptable material. Um, during the late 70s, this is when uh, this stuff became popular in like the Dungeons and Dragons kind of uh, circuit. A, a lot of these characters would go on fantasy adventures and you see see a lot of that, which I, I think is really interesting. And they, they grew into uh, comic books and things like that as well. And you, a lot of these characters showed up in uh, graffiti. And again, the main thing that makes this graffiti is that it is in illegal spaces. It's It's not... Uh, legal for people to do this. And I think what is really fascinating during the early 80s, that's when you start seeing people doing shading and creating almost fonts 
with the work. And they, there are some recognizable fonts. What's so fascinating is that this started showing up in the early 80s. And it became very, very stylized to the point where you almost couldn't read it at all. But you, you see that still today through a, a lot of the country, a, a lot of the U.S. But it also shows up in Nigeria. And what's fascinating to me is about is um, I can't remember the name of the languages. I, I, Adamra, uh, the the ancient um, written language of Ethiopia. There are graffiti artists that will use those characters, but do it in this font style. And you see the same thing with Cyrillic in Russia and uh, uh, different characters around the world. Japanese uh, with the kanji, you see the same kind of thing. I, I think that that's fascinating. And then it starts evolving. A friend of mine, his name is El Cid, and he started looking at graffiti tag sites and thinking that you know, it's just gangs marking their turf, that's pretty upsetting. So what he started doing is uh, he would get permission, so technically it isn't graffiti, but he would start writing Arabic uh, calligraphy in these same spaces that uh, previous taggers would uh, mark. And they were fra Arabic phrases that would remind people of their own value. And um, he was one of the first to do this, but you do start seeing in the 80s people using the graffiti street art tools to create works that are beautiful. You know, it's not just marks, it's not just identifiers. They start becoming really beautiful things. So I, I think that's just amazing. The um, the evolution that graffiti has gone through. And here we, we talk a little bit about uh, some of these evolutions that happened. What is the difference between street art and graffiti? We talked about that, talked about what is street art. And it's, it's real. what is interesting to me is you get a growing population of artists that are graffiti artists. That's what their core is. And then people start realizing, wow, they're, they're doing stuff that people are paying attention to. And then they are engaged in public works project where they are asked to uh, create things specifically for public consumption to beautify neighborhoods. I, I think that that, that, is, that is really the thing, one thing that is astounding to me. So it's gone from being, coming, being a tool of counterculture and sticking it to the man to becoming publicly accessible, publicly consumed, uh, beautifying art. Uh, one of the artists I really like it works in Nigeria. And when they started doing their thing, uh, at first people were really upset, but they would go into neighborhoods that were really run down, looked awful, and use bright colors. They wouldn't, they would not just stop at tagging and things like that. They would actually make mural scenes and uh, beautiful sayings and um, went on to the point where uh, the federal government in Nigeria would contract with them to paint public spaces. And then that created a whole genre of professional artists whose job is to go into neighborhoods and people pay the, the neighborhood communities, pay them to build um, uh, murals to, to beautify the area. And I think I think that that is absolutely astounding. I wanted to, I did want to share something. Let's see if I can find this. Okay, this is about eight minutes long, and before watching this, I want everybody to know. If YouTube, if YouTube edits it out, uh, go and watch it specifically. It, it is in the module. I think it is important to watch. But are you, you guys okay with watching an eight-minute video about this? Okay.
Okay, it is in the graffiti and street art section. And the video is how a train tunnel became the center of New York City's art scene. So that right there, that's the video that we're watching. Okay. Well, there's this tunnel underneath Riverside Park. Steve 161. Okay, did you do you see this guy? Does he look like a countercultural violent revolutionary? Not at all. <laughs> I, I, that, that's one of the reasons why I really like this guy. It's Riverside Park. Steve 161 stole some dynamite from a construction site and he blew a hole in the bathroom. We went down there, slid down this embankment, then we had to jump about five feet from there and there we were in the, in the tunnel. The Freedom Tunnel. Graffiti was ending on trains, and kids were looking for places to paint. So this tunnel became a destination to go. Rough estimates are that 5,000 people live in the tunnels below New York City. Some of the other homeless people that had moved in, I was trying to capture them, the way that they lived. My name is Chris Pape, better known as Freedom, which was my graffiti name. I was there, the Freedom Tunnel. I grew up in New York City, in New York in 64. My memories of it are sort of in black and white. The city was dying, factories left, construction sites were closed down, all of these abandoned lots. It gave birth not only to skate culture, but to graffiti as well. Why did Amazon send me $20,000? Because I use Amazon. I was writing nameless spray paint on a wall, hitting the insides of a subway train. All right, what do I do next? Well, I've, I've, got, I've got to paint the outside of a train. Well, then I have to walk on the tracks. For me, writing wasn't about the rush. I wanted the attendant fame that went with it and the acknowledgement by my peers. And around the same time, my brother said, you know, there's this tunnel underneath Riverside Park. It's a very secretive stuff. All this great death-defying stuff that's very appealing to 14-year-olds. And that's what we did. We went down there, and there we were in the, in the tunnel. And there were freight trains lined up. We climbed up and down the freight trains, uh, hung off the rafters and the ceiling, and did all sorts of things. I like painting graffiti on the trains, but I could never be what some of those guys like Zephyr or Fidandi or Futura, people like that, they were willing to fail in a public level. And what that means in graffiti is that a great deal of writing graffiti is benching what, you know, the trains and watching what you wrote and watching your peers dissect it. So you'd have to sit there with them as they said, you know, oh, Nice job, that really sucks. And I didn't have the heart for that. That's part of what, you know, drove me into the tunnel. The 33-year-old artist's works appear under five city blocks. The concept was just to make the two torsos work together. Why did you choose this space for this? Um, I had always wanted to paint something here. So I did a large freedom to write piece with James Dean underneath. I painted my Mona Lisa. That was the very beginning of the tunnel stuff. In 1986, though, I had become more and more kind of fascinated with the history of graffiti. So I decided to do a long, long sort of half a city block painting of the history of graffiti in this one area where there were all these gratings above. It went from 95th Street to 96th Street because I was generally in the middle of the tunnel. And there was a whole group of people living in the south end of the tunnel. And as I was painting it, this guy uh, came over from the cement cubicles in the dark. So I was up on the ladder and I said, oh, no, 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 thank you, homeless person, go away. And then the next day he came back 
And he was like, hey, man, you know, you can come over. We're just hanging out, sitting by the fire. And I was like, fire? I'm trying to paint my history of graffiti. And by the third day, I was just about done. And I realized I was about as rude as I could be. And um, he didn't come over that day. So I went over to him, had a cup of tea in this charred metal cup that I was sure I was going to get tuberculosis from. I was very good. His name was Bernard. And um, he gave me a little background about himself. Bernard had been a model. He had gone to college. He was a very bright guy. Some of the other homeless people that had moved in that year. And Bernard would always make tea, cups of tea for everybody. And they'd cook omelets and things like that. I continued to check in with Bernard and Bob and the people who lived there each time I went down to paint. And I would have two sketch pads trying to capture them the way that they lived. Rough estimates are that 5,000 people live in the tunnels below New York City. They do not, however, consider themselves homeless. After the book The Mole People came out, a horde of journalists descended on the tunnel. Um, but one of the most intriguing ones was when Jerry Springer came down there. And he was incredibly professional and maybe got more information, I thought, out of Bernard in his interview than anybody else. Did this ever be made into a place for people to live? The late 80s, they were having many problems in the city in the shelters, a lot of uh, murders and crime. And, and I said to myself, why don't the city let me sell me this tunnel, let me renovate this tunnel, and I can house 200 people right here. And in 89, Amtrak purchased it. By 1995, they did seal the tunnel off. A number of the people actually dug with their hands to get underneath the wall uh, to get back into the tunnel, which is um, kind of horrible when you think about it. But Bernard, he was a good friend and uh, he will definitely be missed. Passed away about five years ago. Over the years, um, from 1980 to 1995, I painted a little over 40 paintings. It was a really good time in my life. And the graffiti legends, some failed, some succeeded. I wound up somewhere in the middle by doing illustration. But it was one of those things of, is this stuff only going to work in the tunnel? Or am I ever going to be able to solve that? But the idea that you're making either historical work or work that would become part of the, you know, fine art canon. Uh, and that would be the paintings in the tunnel themselves. Anything that I do off of that is merely a representation of what has happened down there. And um, eventually, as the Freedom Tunnel became a destination for urban explorers around the world, and they all wanted photos in front of by American piece, which was the large epilogue that I did um, about based on my time in the tunnel. So all of these societal factors wound up turning it into something much more than I ever thought it would be. And I'm, I'm thrilled that it happened because it's made a career for me. So what, what did you guys think about that? I thought the history behind uh, Freedom Tunnel was really cool, especially because there was there it was more than just art. It was also a home for for people who were struggling at the time. And I, I think that is really fantastic because um, that becomes a microcosm for the expression of graffiti really around the world. Uh, we look if we go to Spain, Spain has some remarkable graffiti and it's done in areas that people live in. You know, they, they, maybe they don't have 
they haven't built homes there, but it's, you know, like here in the US underpasses near parks, different areas like that. And um, in some areas of the world, graffiti is frowned upon a lot more than it is here in the US. In some areas it's frowned on a lot less. And it's, it's always fascinating to me the kinds of things that people come up with when they do graffiti. I, I, I think that that's pretty remarkable. But I, I like these are different things to think about when we talk about this intersection of graffiti and uh, street art. Sometimes things are done just because they're done for what they are. But also, there are different things to be th thinking about. Like, I, I think graffiti and street art, the legal and ethical issues are always something that are going to be part of the art. You know, is a person pushing against society? Are they working with society? What does that say about their message? Public space and audience engagement, that's always interesting because if somebody doesn't know that the art is there and nobody ever sees it, it seems that it it wouldn't be able to complete itself, be complete as art if nobody ever experiences it. And this, but all these considerations, social and political commentary, are there comments? Are, are the people just doing stuff? Are they working by themselves or are they working with communities? And are they doing interesting and new things? What, we, what we've seen so far is people basically, three the three kinds of graffiti that we've seen so far is um, scratching, pigment application, and spray paint. It's pretty much. But there are a lot of other ways. I mean, for in some neighborhoods, the street art is almost entirely pasting up paper and making images like that. In a lot of areas, it's a combination of different practices. There's a street art artist in China that I really like where you will find buildings that have layers of paint and plaster on them. And he will chisel through the layers and make his artwork as you see the different layers of materials emerge as he chisels through them. You know, definitely some very interesting things. Now, you know, keeping those things in mind, why would I start by talking about the artist as profit? Yeah, Jen Jenny, you had your hand up? Yeah, I was just gonna say something about the video really quick. Um, I thought was interesting is, um, the, the artist, the F freedom, I don't remember his name, but he, he painted the David and also like the persistence, pre uh, persistence of art where like the, the clock was melting. Um, uh, right. and so he's obviously really well educated in classical art as well as like contemporary art. And so I think it's interesting that he's showing his style in a in a way in this medium and also like to me this graffiti is kind of the same as you if you would hang a painting in your house does that make sense like you're 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 creating art in the area you live in a way that we would hang painting in our house yeah it, it definitely does feel very different than hobo tagging doesn't it it, it is it is very different it seems that he's saying something. And I love when he was talking about the in days of interaction with the, the uh, members of the homeless community when it dawned on him, I'm being a jerk. And he went over and made friends with them. And then that relationship continued until um, they, that one friend died. You know, uh, they, they were friends for the rest of the, their lives. And it's it's interesting to me that there is that engagement with um, intellectualism that seems to be a very different thing than keeping it at just I, uh, noting I was here and letting everybody know that you were there. And I, I, I think that's a really good observation. That's a powerful observation because it helps you realize that there are depths. You know, these, these artists weren't just uh, vandalizers. And I think that that's, 
even though legally this is vandalism because they are dam damaging property without permission it is interesting to me that it is a lot more than just uh, destruction of property you know th there's something going on that that's outside of that but um does it make sense to you now that I would talk a little bit about the artist role as prophet before going into the street art and graffiti conversation? Does that kind of make sense? You see where it ties together? Because more than paintings during any other art period or movement, street art addresses issues on a really visceral immediate level. And I, I think that the the difference between these two kind of things that I, that I want that I want to to get at is the difference between somebody describing to you if you touch the stove while the element is red it will hurt and hurt is a label to something we experience that we do not want to experience anymore and we want to get away from very quickly. And then on the other hand, you have somebody yelling at you as you are reaching your hand towards the element and then you touch it and suddenly you feel all those, those things at once. So it's, it's a very, it's a big difference. It's, it's hard to describe completely, but one is an intellectual appreciation and the other one is visceral experience. And uh, when we think about that in relationship with street art and the artist being profit, the street art seems to be, and graffiti seems to be a venue through which somebody can really express um, concern with uh, certain levels of immediacy that really attract your attention immediately. And I, I, I think the difference in that case is more the difference between a crossing guard by a school crossing and somebody in an ambulance honking their horn at you while their siren is going. Do you, do you, do you see what I'm getting at, that, that kind of idea? And, I, and so I, it is a fascinating genre of art that we're, we're talking about because I feel it is something that only really seems to be um, engaged with intellectually today. You know, just, just it, it's, it seems to be that intellectual conversation about street art, public art, and graffiti seems to be something that we, we only have really to any extent today. Would you, would you guys agree with that? It seems to be it seems to be indicative of contemporary civilization is what I'm saying. It's other stuff. They would leave it for other people to see today. They create to force us to react. And I think, I think that's another way of, of detailing that difference. And, um, so I, I want to show you, I want everybody to go through these artists, look at them and see what you think. But I, we, I only, I'm only going to talk about a couple of them. These are artists. I really love all these artists that, that I've picked. Um, this is Osa 7 is the one I was, I was telling you about. And um, let's see, give me just a second here. I've tried to do both articles and videos for each of the artists so that if you want to watch the video, you can watch the video. If you don't, you can uh, you can read the article. Okay, so Banksy, are you guys familiar with Banksy? So I'm, the computer was freezing a little bit. Let's. So we're we're not gonna we're not gonna watch this video, 
but I want to show you some of the works by Banksy. So definitely when you have um, go back, do watch this video. What's fascinating about Banksy is that everybody claims that nobody knows who he is and officially nobody knows who he is or, or they or she or whatever. Um, nobody knows who Banksy is. And what's fascinating to me is that there are sometimes very poignant scenes that Banksy will create, sometimes very viscerally charged scenes that Banksy will create. Um, sometimes the commentary is very obvious and sometimes the commentary is a little bit more subtle. And this is also the one where he shredded something right after somebody paid a lot of money for it. But these are the kinds of things that I really like seeing from Banksy. Where these engaging with the, the artist is engaging with the in, um, visual industrial land, um, urban landscape and making you think, you know, engaging you in the thought process. And sometimes it's humorous. Sometimes it's sad, and sometimes it's just ironic. I, th I th think it, in any case, it's, it's really fascinating. Like Mona Lisa with a bazooka. This one I think is uh, a really sad, where on one corner it's a dumpster fire and on the other corner it's a little kid uh, get, catching the, the ash flakes from the dumpster uh, fire as if they're snowflakes. So lo lots of kind of interesting ideas there. And then another artist I wanted to have you look at is uh, Osa 7, and I, I would like you to go through and look at all of these. There, there are several articles and stuff like that, but there's um, short videos on each of them. Osa 7 is out of Nigeria, and what they do is these really large public works projects that just bring color into areas that seem devastated. And I want to show you, so this, this wall, you know, we, we look at, this is a wall with just the tagging. And then after OSA 7 gets done with it, it, it it's transformed into something like this, which I, can you guys, can you guys see the difference, feel the difference? You know, one just feels like they're they're staking their claim, and the other one feels like Osa Seven is really doing something. And I I think that that's pretty amazing. So like I said, I, I picked a lot of artists. I, I want you to look at, at uh, as many of these artists as you can. One of the things I really love is uh, Blue and this animation. And um, we don't have time to for me to show it to you. Well, it's 10 minutes long. We'll watch a little bit of it without the sound and you, so you guys can kind of see what's going on. But it's totally worth watching it. So the artist's name is Blue, and this particular one is called Big Bang, Big Boom. And look, watch the animation that happens. Okay, how is this person animating what's going on? 
multiple photographs? Yes, yeah, multiple photographs as they're actually painting the environment. So it's not, they're not, do, it's not digital, it's all, it's all physical animation. And every time something is done, you can see all the previous things that are done as well. We're gonna skip ahead a little bit. So when you, when you can, take a moment and watch the whole thing. But can you kind of see what's going on? The artist is drawing from the, from the natural world or you know, from the physical world. And then and they're building this stop motion animation. And it just there's all sorts of different things that are going on. And it, it just it's it's very interesting. It's an awful lot of fun. But this is an example of uh, street art or, or public art that is done in concert with the, the community. We, you know, OSA 7 did that. We started getting commissioned by Nigerian governments um, to beautify neighborhoods. And then Blue goes a couple steps further than that by working specifically with communities to create these viral uh, animations. And it, just like what um, Jean-Claude and Crystal did, it really revitalizes the entire community. People are involved, uh, gets a lot of notoriety, people are become engaged in their own living environment. And it just it does a lot of really interesting things. And I, I want to, to show you guys, you guys have heard of uh, Basquiat, haven't you? Or have you? Is he one of the artists that we talked? He isn't one of the artists we talked about directly, is he? He was an um, a neo expressionist who uh, did a lot of work in the late 70s and early 80s and then ended up passing away. And I want to. We're, we're, I want to show you clips from a video. We're not going to watch the video, but let me show you where it is so that you can watch the video yourself. And this is in the last section of the module. And then as, as you look at his stuff, so it's right here at the bottom, Basquiat. As you look at his stuff, think about the different things that we've looked at with street art. Um, some street art, a lot of the stuff that we looked at has been um, painting, spray painting. And then that, that blue, when we looked at blue, a lot of blue stuff involves like real world movement, stop motion animation, stuff like that. And then uh, converted into painting as well. What Basquiat did is a lot of this uh, paste signage where uh, you would you'd see in a lot of uh, cities, part of the, the visual landscape is uh, posters that are pasted up onto walls. And then, uh, and graffiti then becomes, uh, or uses that as part of its visual language. And what Basquiat managed to do is create these paintings where he was mimicking that as well as using it in the work itself. So let me see if I can move forward and so you can see some of the stuff that he did. And, you know, he's referencing the things that he encountered in the city, the large cities that he lived in. And so, he, so here we're looking at some of the work and you can see the overlapping textures like you might see in a city environment. You're seeing uh, pasted papers like you might see in an urban environment, plus the, that painting like we saw with a lot of the the painted graffiti that we saw. And what Basquiat managed to do is build up a large volume of visual work 
by adapting those textures and those uh, things that he saw in an urban environment and bring it into a gallery setting, which I, I think is really fascinating. So now we, we go kind of full circle through all the things we've been talking about. We, we looked at people being serious painters, being considered serious painters because they are and having uh, actual paintings commissioned and done. We saw that in the Renaissance. We, and then more contemporarily, we see the tagging by, you know, the hobo tagging and, and people using graffiti as a means to um, just express a voice that they felt they lost. And then Basquiat takes a lot of that and brings it into a gallery setting. So it returns to that kind of classical art uh, presentation. And I think that, that stuff like that is absolutely fascinating. So his work is definitely not graffiti because it is legal and it takes place in a gallery, but it really feels like it has a lot of that same kind of energy, I think. What do you guys think? Just from a little bit that you saw. All right, so there are um, several other artists to look at and I do want you to look at as many of them as you can. Watch the videos. Uh, both these guys are pretty amazing, but I, I really like that the video from Blue is like the full animation, so it is kind of long. And then we get uh, different artists applying the street art material that they've found into targeted ways of helping people. So remember, we, we talked about the uh, um, artist as prophet who's a self-reflector for the for the culture, uh, kind of a, um, an evaluator of the culture. And then Wasley Kandinsky also talks about the artist as, as the prophet slash artist as somebody who is um, inviting the culture to go somewhere new or inviting the culture forward and this is this page is we're talking a lot about that where the artist is not necessarily even giving uh, um, an easily communicated message but the artist is presenting something that either invites the, the community to participate or invites the community to think and do things to make things different and to move forward. And I, I think that that's really very interesting. Um, and the last thing I want to show you is a time lapse. This, um, this is done by a person who is a graffiti, graffiti artist, then became a street artist, and now they were asked to do a mural on the outside of a, um, a hospital and clinic. And this is just a time lapse of that. Okay, think about what this person has to do. They are only able to work on this platform, but somehow they've got to draw these lines all the way across this space. How do you think they're doing that? The system that they're using is called grid enlargement. It was actually used, it's documented as being used by Egyptian tomb painters. So this person is using a 4,000 year old technique to do stuff that they completed just a, a little while ago. So very contemporary. Isn't that interesting?
what do you guys think about that? Isn't that, I, I think that that's interesting just to watch, but the person is using graffiti materials, using a graffiti process, a street art process, doing something that's outside of a healing center to create something that um, is intended as a hopeful space. Do you think that this feels like a hopeful space? I, I think it's interesting to me because the colors used, the shapes used, everything, it feels inviting. It feels energetic and exciting, but it's done with a similar uh, visual vocabulary to some of the, the really gross stuff that we've seen in, in earlier graffiti that was just designed to express anger. And I, I really love that where a person is taking a, um, a relatively negative vocabulary and using it to make something hopeful. I, that's really astounding to me. What do you guys think? What do you guys think about the module we, uh, we talked about today? There is more to graffiti than I originally thought, because I, I had an idea that it was just that it, in order for it to be considered graffiti, it had to be illegal that you didn't have permission, but I didn't know that it extended beyond that, that it developed, that it developed from like, from a desire to express anger, that it evolved into some, into a form of art that people were generally interested in. There, there's a lot of layers to it that we just, we don't think about, I think generally. And it's exciting to me that so many artists engage so many of those layers that we can really see what they're doing. And I love the fact that people moved it from the illegal space, didn't doing a lot of the same kinds of things into the public realm where they don't have to hide and, and run away from the police. That people are actually paying them to decorate their buildings. So it's no longer vandalism. I, I think that's really astounding. What do, what do you think, Jenny? What, what did you respond to? Um, I think it's interesting because graffiti is ever it's everywhere and it's one of those things that you kind of grow up just seeing and not really like thinking too much about it differently. Um, when I was doing the reflection, it was I found a really cool image of um the renaissance painters um with the little ninja turtle masks on their face right. oh yeah um and i thought it was really interesting like seeing it as a street art um and then someone went over and they tagged it with graffiti and so it was really cool to see the i mean it's sad that this beautiful mural got destroyed with graffiti but it was really cool to see the two really playing together and there's this um, social media per, uh, person that I've seen on video, and he'll cover, like, um, like the swastika, for instance, with, like, a positive um, image instead. Like, with an ice cream cone, for example, he'll, like, cover the, the bad, the evil tagging with something more positive. I, I, I see stuff like that, and I think it, it's kind of fun to see there's almost these intellectual conversations going on with the art and it, it's visceral and immediate and you can do that. It's, it's really kind of interesting. And I'm, I'm glad that you guys are thinking about this rather than just something that you, you see and pass over. Um, you're really thinking about it as, yeah, holy cow, this actually is an art medium. I, that, that's really fun to see. Well, are there any last observations or questions? for today. All right, good. I am, uh, I will be posting this um, again. If there's any of the videos that are missing from the YouTube uh, presentation of this class, they are in the, the module and I've uh, pointed out what they are each time right before we watch the video in case anybody misses it. But I, I've been enjoying this. Remember that new video format for the weekly reflection. And give me feedback next week if that works. I am I'm hoping that if you have several that need to be turned in, do a few of them with the video format and see how, how much faster it is.
because you're, you're going to accomplish the same kind of thing, but it will be in a video voiceover rather than written. All right, I hope you guys have a wonderful week and weekend, and I look forward to seeing you next Thursday. Happy pre-Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy right, pre-Thanksgiving. We'll, <laughs> we'll see you next week.